Welcome back to Bio6612. Today I'm going to talk about goodness of fit tests for logistic regression. In particular, we'll cover um, model deviance, null and saturated models, and these are both things you need to look at goodness of fit statistics and uh, tests that allow you to tell you if your model is a good fit for your data. And there's quite a bit of stuff about these in both of the optional readings, so I would encourage you to take a look at those if you're curious to learn more. So the goodness of fit of a statistical model describes how well it fits a set of observations, i.e. the data. Basically, uh, even if our main goal is to estimate the effects of the predictors on the outcome, we still want to end up with a model that does a decent job of fitting the data. And so there are a couple ways of, of looking into this. There are two goodness of fit tests you can use for logistic regression model, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. These are the deviance goodness of fit test and the hosmer lemesho statistic. And then there are also information criterions, um, which I'll talk about in a, a lectures next week. But the deviance, deviance goodness of fit test um, is a specific kind of likelihood ratio statistic that, um, and in this goodness of fit test, we compare the model of interest to what's called a saturated model, which I'll get to into the next slide. Uh, and this can only be used to test goodness of fit for grouped data and models that are nested. The hosmer lemesho statistic um, can test goodness of fit for subject level data, data that's not grouped, and it's most appropriate, in fact, when the number of covariate patterns is either one for each subject or close to the number of observations in the data set. This is also only for nested models. If you want to be able to compare models that are not nested, you can use information criterion so they, they will not give you a actual significance test. Um, and that's something that I'm not going to talk about in this lecture, but I will talk about later on. So the saturated model is a model that perfectly predicts the data that you observe. Uh, and the intuition behind the goodness of the test is that uh, we can compare our model of interest to the saturated model, and we want our model of interest to be able to predict some uh, almost as well as the saturated model. So for subject level data, the saturated model contains as many predictors as unique subject profiles and provides perfect prediction of the observed zero or one outcome for each subject. Then for group level data, the saturated model contains as many predictors as unique covariate patterns. And it provides perfect prediction on the observed proportion of cases within the groups defined by unique covariate patterns. And so deviance is a numeric value that compares the model of interest to the saturated model. It says it allows you to test the goodness of, and, and the deviance is it's a number. I'll, I'll show you in, in a, the next slide how to calculate it. But basically, um, you can use this deviance, model deviance, to test the goodness of fit and get a p-value, but only for group level data. And the intuition behind deviance is like how far, we want to know how far our model is from the saturated model. And it's a form of the likelihood ratio test statistic. Basically, um, if the likelihood under our model is much smaller than the likelihood under the saturated model, then this suggests our model has a poor fit. And conversely, if the likelihood under our model is close to the deviance uh, or the likelihood under the saturated model, then this suggests our model has a good fit. So yeah, as I said, the deviance compares the model of interest to the saturated model. And it is calculated using this equation here, um, where it's just two times the log likelihood for the saturated model minus the log likelihood for the model of interest. And how do you find those log likelihoods? Well, that's basically by taking by um, getting the regular log likelihood that you would that you wrote out in earlier lectures and plugging in the covariate values for the saturated model and the model of interest. 
and this this quantity, this deviance quantity, um, under certain conditions follows the chi-squared distribution with a degree of freedom. And because it has an approximate chi-squared distribution, that's why you can use it to get a p-value. Um, in this case, the degrees of debris, uh, freedom depend on the difference in the number of parameters in the saturated model and model of interest. And previously, we've looked at tests where um, that number of the degrees of freedom was one for the chi-squared test. Often when you're looking at a deviance-based um, goodness of fit test, the degrees of freedom is not going to be equal to one. And here I said, yeah, the deviance has a chi-squared distribution. What I mean is actually it has an approximate or asymptotic chi-squared distribution. So that's only going to be true, first of all, when n is very large. Um, and it's also only true for grouped data, where m, which is your number of covariate patterns, is relatively small, and ni, which is the number of subjects in each of those covariate pattern groups, uh, is relatively large. So basically, uh, what this, uh, this goodness of fit test is saying is that if the deviance is less than the upper 95% percentage of the chi-squared distribution it follows, then the logistic model fits well. And uh, this is an analog for R-squared for logistic regression. And another thing I want to mention here is that you can actually calculate deviance for any exponential family distribution you want. It's just that it won't always have this chi-squared distribution. And it will only have a chi-squared distribution, in fact, for things that satisfy these criteria and also for, in some cases, for Poisson uh, regression, which we'll cover later. So other, there, deviance has a lot of names. You can also call it model, model deviance or residual deviance. Um, and we just talked about saturated models, but at the other extreme of saturated models is the, um, null, is the null model. Uh, and this is an intercept only model, a model where you don't have any covariates at all. Uh, and the deviance for this model is called the null deviance. And that is calculated the same. The null deviance is calculated by null deviance is 2 times the log likelihood of the saturated model um, minus the log likelihood of the null model, where null, null model means intercept only model. This is the null deviance. And if none of the covariates are actually significant in your model, then the deviance for the model of interest probably won't be much different from your null deviance. So here are the steps that we would go through to conduct a deviance goodness of fit test. So in the first step, um, we define, well, te technically in the first step, we usually define our population parameters, but here um, we're saying that our null hypothesis is that the model fits the data versus the null hypo the alternative hypothesis that the model does not fit the data. I'm going to assume an alpha level of 0.05, so that should be um, that should be 0.05, not 0.5. And you're assuming your independent observations for your data and that you have group level data with M, which is the number of covariate patterns, is quite a bit smaller than the number of observation within each covariate pattern. Uh, then we'll calculate our test statistic, which is called 
um, we can call this, the deviance itself is called the test statistic, or you can call it this g squared uh, for a goodness of fit test. Uh, and it's just, yeah, two times the log likelihood of the saturated mile, model minus the log likelihood of the model of interest, which has an approximate chi-square distribution. With degrees of freedom being the number of parameters in the saturated model minus the number of parameters in the model of interest. And then this should be a 5 and a 6, but the formatting gets weird sometimes with our markdown. Um, it will reject the null hypothesis if the um, deviance value is greater than the chi-squared value for the selected degrees of freedom, selected alpha value. And you calculate a p-value as the probability that that chi-squared value is greater than the value um, for the test statistic that you observed. And the conclusion is... Um, sort of reversed from how you normally think about hypothesis testing, where in this case, we don't really want to reject the null hypothesis. If we like the model that we're testing, uh, we want it to fit the data, so we would rather not reject the null. So we're gonna go through a deviance example using this budworm data that I talked about a few lectures ago. Um, as a reminder, this data comes from an experiment on the toxicity of doses of a poison to the tobacco budworm, which is a moth that eats tobacco. Um, and in this experiment, batches of 20 moths of each sex were exposed for three days to the poison, and each batch received a different dose of poison. Um, and then the number of, in each batch that died was recorded, where success is uh, equal death. And then this is grouped data. You have uh, six doses and two sexes. So for a total of 12 covariate patterns. And um, there were 20 moths in each covariate pattern here. So again, so for sex, uh, one is equal to male, this is a binary variable. One is equal to male and zero is equal to female. Dose is in milligrams. And um, S is the number of budworms killed and N is the total number of budworms. So we can read in that data. And uh, I want dose to be a factor variable, not a continuous variable, because we want this to be treated as grouped data. And I'm gonna also calculate this, I also calculate this variable proportion dead, which is the number of um, budworms that were killed in each group. So this is what the data structure looks like. Um, there are 12 rows because there is a separate row for each uh, covariate pattern. And let's say our model of interest is a model of with both sex and dose, because we're, we're really interested in the dose that's our main covariate of interest, let's say but we also want to control for six because we think it might be a potential confounder. So we like that model, that's the model that we're interested in and we wanna see if it fits the data. So this R code here actually runs that model and stores the results. However, we're also gonna compare it with the null model. So as I said, the null model is the intercept only model, a model with no covariates. Um, so I'm running the null model here. In R, you can run an intercept um, only model by running a tilde one instead of a tilde and then uh, the covariates you're interested in. And finally, I'm gonna run the saturated model. So when you have group level data, you can run the saturated, a saturated model um, by including all covariates and all possible interaction terms. So in our case, we have only two covariates. So the saturated model would be um, the model with an intercept, a covariate for sex, uh, a covariate dose, and then also an interaction between sex and dose. And this is actually a simplified way of writing out this model. In fact, dose is a six level factor variable. So there will actually be five coefficients for dose. Um, where um, dose for one milligram is the reference uh, 
category. So that would actually be written, fully written now. It's more like beta one plus beta one. I'm just gonna say x1 for sex plus beta two. I'm gonna say two, two for dose. Two plus beta two four for dose four plus beta two eight for dose eight and so on. So you actually um, would expand this if you wanted to write out the full model to have five for terms for dose and then five interaction terms as well. So I actually ran this model in R by, uh, we talked about interactions recently, so you can do all interaction, the interactions and then their main effects by doing just multiplying the coefficients together in R. And this is gonna, and just looking at the coefficients that are produced, all of the coefficients are listed here. So again, now I have a coefficient um, for the intercept, for sex, I have five coefficients for dose because it's a um, six level factor variable. I have five interaction terms between sex and dose. And um, yeah, those are my estimates and p-values. And this is a saturated model. So, how do we calculate the log likelihoods for each of these models? Well, for group level data, the log likelihood is given here, where M is the number of covariate patterns, S is the number of successes in the nth covariate pattern, and N is number of trials in the nth covariate pattern. So N is gonna be equal to 20 uh, for each covariate pattern for our budworm data. And so basically for each possible covariate pattern, we have the, um, the PDF and then we just multiply those PDFs together. So I can calculate that in R, I just wrote a function called that I'm calling the log likelihood function that takes in arguments N for the total number of um, subjects or budworms in this data, S for the number that died in each group, and then X beta. So the val, and we're here, X beta is the value of X times the estimated coefficient value. You plug each of those in and you can get a likelihood for each of your covariate patterns. And so I can use that function then and I can use the beta values that were calculated in each of my models um, that I defined in R to calculate the log likelihood for each of those different models. So say I just was interested in the X beta values. So here what I'm doing, I'm taking the budworm data and I'm adding a column that says, okay, for each of your covariate patterns of interest. Let's see what those X beta values are. And for any model that you define using GLM, you can just do this uh, dollar sign and then linear dot predictors, and that will give you your X beta values, just for your information. Okay, so what I'm doing next is I, for each of the models I'm interested in, I am using this log likelihood function that I defined up here to calculate the log likelihood. So I'm gonna take the value of N from the data, the value of S from the data. And then for this first one, MOI stands for model of interest. I am, in this case, uh, plugging in the X beta for the model of interest to give me a log likelihood value for that particular covariate pattern uh, using the model of interest. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the null model. Granted, the, only, the N and the S are the same because those are always the same for each covariate pattern. 
Uh, and what's changing is the X beta I'm using here. I'm using the X beta for the null model. And then the third thing, I am doing the same thing where I'm defining the loglihood, likelihood using the X beta from the saturated model. This will give me, and so I encourage you to run this code line by line to see what it's doing. But this, this first chunk, this chunk will give you uh, the log likelihood for the model of interest, the null model, and the saturated model. And it will give it to you for each different covariate pattern. And what we actually want is overall, summed up over all the covariate patterns, what are these likelihoods? So that's what I'm doing in this next step, is I am just adding, for each different covariate pattern, I am adding up the separate log likelihoods to get a log, log likelihood for the null model, the model of interest, and the saturated model that is just one number. And that those numbers are printed down here. So the log likelihood is the smallest for the null model and the largest for the saturated model. And that's, what's, that's what we would expect to see because the saturated model is gonna give you the largest likelihood that you can expect. Like you can't get your likelihood that's any bigger than that for the data that you've observed. Um, and the null model is gonna give you the smallest one that you could get for the day. Um, and so your model of interest is going to be somewhere in between that. And ideally you want it to, if you like your model, um, you want it to be closer to the log likelihood for the saturated model than the log likelihood for the null model. And by the way, I didn't need to calculate the log likelihood the way that I did in the previous step. I just want to give you intuition for how it works. Um, instead, um, there's a way to sort of harness what R returns in the GLM function to give you uh, the and a more easier and more, to calculate the log likelihood more easily. And you can do that using the AIC. An AIC is a metric we can use to compare models that I'll talk about in um, a lecture next week. Um, and AIC is defined as two times. P, where P is the number of parameters in your model, minus two times the log likelihood. So we can reverse engineer that to get um, that your log likelihood of interest. Is equal to two times your the number of parameters that you have over, no, minus the AIC over two. And to do that in R, what you do is you figure out the number of parameters in your model, which um, for the model of interest is seven because you have your beta zero for your intercept, you have your beta one for sex, and then you have five betas for dummy, uh, that are all dummy variables for dose. To get seven total. Um, and you can calculate the number of parameters in your model by just taking the coefficients from your model and calculating the length. So then your log likelihood using that is just two times the number of parameters minus the AIC, which you can get from your model as just dollar sign AIC, then divide by two. And so what you end up with, doing it this way, for your model of interest, you get a log likelihood, which is negative 17.56, which is exactly what we calculated in the previous slide. So that's a good sanity check. So, how do we actually calculate the deviance? Um, so, what I'm doing in this code chunk here is I'm doing just that. First, I'm summing up over the log likelihoods for each of the covariate patterns, and I'm doing this to get the log likelihood for the null model, the model of interest, and the saturated model. 
Then I'm calculating the deviance for the null model, also called the null deviance, which is two times the log likelihood for the saturated model, which we just defined here, minus the log likelihood for the null model. And similarly, the deviance for the model of interest is two times the log likelihood for the saturated model minus the log likelihood for the model of interest. And so there is gonna, the deviance, if we wanted to say, what is the deviance for the saturated model? Well, that's just gonna be equal to zero because it would be the saturated model minus the saturated model. Uh, okay, so when you calculate those deviance values, you get the deviance for the null model to be about 125, and then the deviance for the um, model of interest to be five. And generally speaking, um, you want your deviance to be small if you like your model. So it's good that we have a smaller deviance for a model of interest than the null deviance. The null deviance is the largest deviance that you could get because it's the farthest you can possibly be from the saturated model. Once again, um, your uh, R actually returns this deviance value for you. You don't have to calculate it uh, by hand the way that I just did here. You can do um, for your GLM function, model of interest, uh, dollar sign deviance will give you the deviance for your current model. And for your current model, you also can um, return the null deviance because um, that's, that's stored as well. So how do we use these values to do the actual deviance goodness of fit test for our model of interest? Well, using the deviance calculated above in the previous slide, that deviance was um, for our null, for our, sorry, for our model of interest, the deviance was 5.01. Um, and the degrees of freedom, um, is equal to the number of parameters in the saturated model minus the number of parameters in the model of interest, which ends up being five. Uh, and so here, yeah, here's our test statistic, the deviance that we calculated in the previous slide. And we know that that follows a chi-squared di distribution um, with five degrees of freedom. And the critical value for a chi-squared distribution with five degrees of freedom at the 0 0.05 alpha level is 11.07. So in this case, we would say, okay, our deviance is 5.01, which is less than 11.07. Fail to reject H naught. And our conclusion is that the model fits the data. Of course, this may be a theme that you're noticing, but you don't have to do this by hand. There's a way to do it um, in R directly. And you can do this using an ANOVA statement where you do an ANOVA of your model of interest. In this case, I'm, the I'm gonna test the goodness of fit for the null model in this code here. Um, so you plug in your model of interest and then you plug in the saturated model. And you say test is equal to likelihood ratio test and that will actually conduct the deviance test for you here. Um, <clears throat> there are other ways to use the likelihood ratio test um, for logistic regression to test things you might be interested in, and I will get to that next week. But in this case, um, if you have the saturated model as your second model here, um, you are doing a deviance uh, goodness of fit test. And I plugged in the null model here to test um, whether or not the null model is a good fit for the data, but you could also plug in your model of interest um, there as well. And what you end up with in this case is a significant p-value and a very large um, deviance or chi-squared value. Um, and that tells you that in this case, we do reject H-naught, so um, the null model is not a good fit to the data.
So that was the deviance goodness of fit test. What do we do if we want to test goodness of fit for our model, but we don't have group level data? Well, when we have subject level data or group level data with a large number of groups um, and small number of subjects in each group, then we can't use deviance to test model fit. Why? And that's because deviance won't have an approximate chi-squared distribution anymore. And so the hosmer lemeshow test statistic is a way of sort of getting around that to give you an alternative goodness of fit statistic when the number of covariate patterns is, is close to the number of observations in the data set. And what you do when you calculate this test statistic is you divide your data into G groups, and G is an arbitrary number of groups. Usually it's chosen to be 10, so you divide your data into deciles. And then you obtain the test statistic by comparing the observed versus the expected frequencies in the G categories. Um, and this is the Pearson chi-squared statistic for a two by G table of observed and expected frequencies. You can calculate the test statistic here. You then compare the homer lemeshout test statistic to a chi-squared distribution with G minus two degrees of freedom. And your hy null hypothesis would be that the model fits the data versus the alternative that the model does not fit the data. Um, where here, large values of the test statistic and small p-values indicate that you don't have a good model fit. But one thing that's important to note about this test is that this is sort of an ad hoc method. Uh, ad hoc in the sense that G is not, um, you can't choose G in a principled way, it's just kind of arbitrary. So, and it also doesn't necessarily have good properties. For example, it has low power. Um, so it's okay to use this test um, to have a general sense of model fit, but I wouldn't interpret uh, the p-value super rigidly. Like if you get like a p is like 0.04, I wouldn't say, oh, this is a terrible model, or oh, if, or if, similarly, if I get like p equals 0.06, I wouldn't say, oh, this is definitely a great model. It's just sort of a another tool that you can use to help assess how good your model is. All right, that's it for today.